Right, the question is, he says, you said the jinn affects the weak people, but it affected our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was not weak. You're, you're right there that it had affected our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But what affected him was a very, very, very strong sihr. Very, very, very strong black magic. That if it happened to anyone else, it would have immediately killed them. But with our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, because he was so pure and he was so great and he was so strong, it only had some effect on him, you know, on his memory in only like his wudu where he said to Aisha, he said, oh Aisha, did I wash that part? This was only through that sihr. And then he, you know, he was lying down and obviously Jibreel and Mikhail came to him and revealed Qur'an al Nas, Qur'an al farat Now this wasn't just a jinn, this was, this was a, a very strong sihr that affected our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And again, with weak people, I'm not saying it only affects weak people. Weak people. Don't get that message wrong. The, they, they can, out of strong people and weak people, there are more weak people that will get affected than strong people. That's the message that I'm giving. Can jinn get into children with special needs, disabled? I work with special needs children and some of the things you mentioned, these children show signs of, like the growling or the women lifting seven men, etc. whatever. Look, I, I don't know. See, the only way you will find out is to take it to a person who has specialist knowledge and who deals with these cases. And they've got a number of ways of testing whether the person has been affected. One way to test, as I said, you read the Quran. Another way to test is you do istikhara. Some of the shuyukh, they do istikhara. Another way to test is that they may, you know, blow onto some water to make the person drink to see the effects of it. Um, another way they might uh, affect is for them to ask the person to recite Quran. I mean, I, I, was, well, I was in one case up north where uh, I was in a house and there was a woman. Um, she had something abnormal with her doctors, couldn't find anything wrong. And it was only when I asked her to read the Quran that she was, that I found out that she's, she's definitely affected by something. Because as soon as she started reading the Quran, she couldn't actually read. She would stop and she would start shaking. You know, shake her body would shake, and then I would tell her to read again, and she would start reading and then get drowsy and start shaking. So when these signs are there, then you know that there is, you know, a good sign, a good likeness that the person can basically be affected. The two examples of boys affected by jinns were acknowledged. These boys were innocent, supposedly knew nothing about jinns. How come they were affected? As Allah in Surah Nahal. Um, Okay, the two boys, two examples of boys affected by which two examples is, she, is the person referring to? Which two, two one that did I say? If it's the madrasa, that, that okay, the, the, the boy that was sort of affected. The thing is, look, again, the, the Quran says yes, the Quran does say when you recite the Quran, you say, that's a, that's a separate hukum. For the Quran, recitation of the Quran is not necessarily. Uh, I mean, obviously, you can say that if you want to be protected by by shaitan, by jinn, you can say "Awwadu billahi min shaitan rajim," "Awwadu billahi min shaitan rajim," and that will be a form of your protection that can be used. However, in this case, this boy that was being affected wasn't in that particular you know, time reciting it. Um, why was he affected? Because he probably just walked into a great influence of shayatin. And they just wanted to just have a little play around, whatever, you know, just to influence him. Sometimes it happens. He was a weak individual who walked inside there, perhaps without any protection. Who knows what state he was in when he walked in there. So he perhaps got affected. It's not something which um, had to you know, happen for any reason. Please tell us of the danger of Halloween taking part in it. There's no danger of Halloween. <laughs> Absolutely, I'm just telling you, how many Halloweens have you had in your life, as, as long as you've lived, right? Yep, there's nothing, there's nothing out there. It's just myth. Because it's a pagan ritual, in this country used to have a lot of witches. There's a lot of witchcraft, and witches and so on. This was the part of the year they used to hold a festival to burn and kill those witches. That's, what, that's all it was. This was the part of the year they used to have a lot of festivals in 
his little England here, where they used to kill them, and that's, that's all it was. Whether they were real witches or not witches, or they were accused of witchcraft or not, I don't know, but in the 14th, 15th century, he was, was at a high 15th, 16th century, and they used to kill them. Now, there's nothing out there, there's absolutely nothing, it's just a normal night. And tomorrow on 31st of October, it's just going to be a normal night, night like any other nights. Unless, of course, you want to go down to the graveyard, you're on your own, yeah? Well, you're, you're invited to go down. <laughs> some people ask me, you know, some people say to me, they say, um, Sheikh, we want to hear some jinn stories. I say, well, you know, not in broad daylight, come on, man, you know? <laughs> it's not going to excite me, it's not going to be any good to you, right? So then I tell him to do it in the night time, yeah? When you do it in the night time, it's different. And like, right now, you have so many people around you, you've got the lights on, it's, we should have just been in a dark room with a little candlelight, yeah? And they would have seen a different, would have seen a difference. Yeah? Because once what I did is, um, I was uh, one, one group of people from White Men Road Masjid, they said, look, we're going to go to one house and we we'll talk about jinns. This was years ago. I said, fine. I said, not in daylight. I said, it has been night time. So we went to night time, went in the house. We were sitting there. I'm telling you, these are grown up adults here. By the time I was finishing with all the jinn stories, right? They were like, the women were hiding behind the men shaking, right? And even the men were looking, like, who can I hide behind? You know what I'm saying? Like, who can I find, right? Because the thing is, you've got to, You've got to say them at the at sort of the right time. People get, and it's all stories. You understand? Um, some of the, whatever I'm relate to your facts, right? But sometimes some things that you hear out there are not facts. They're just they're just things that people spread around. What is the difference between jinn and shayateen, and are they from the same origin? Yes, I was going to actually explain that in the in the uh, talk, and it's glad that they brought this up. Jinn is to do with all of them that have been created from this creation of unseen creatures that are moving around us and around the world. We don't see them, they see us. However, shayateen are those jinn that have become rebellious and started to disobey Allah or to do something evil. Shayateen doesn't have to only be used for jinn. There's a common mistake that we make. You can have men and women that are shayateen, you can have jinns that are shayateen. And evidence of that is in the Holy Quran, we say, min al jinnati wan nas. You can have shayateen from the jinns, you can have shayateen from, the, from, the, from humankind. What does that mean? It means that they're just evil. They're evil and they do evil things, and they're, they're, they've got devilish acts. You know, whatever that is, being mean, being horrible, being cruel and so on. That's shaytan. So all the jinns that are cruel, that are unrighteous, that are, you know, that, that are um, uh, oppressive, that are rebellious, that are disobedient to Allah, they are shayateen. That's the difference between the two. I am afraid whenever I am alone in darkness, is this normal? I pray five times a day, mostly in the masjid. I, re I recite the Quran, call to Jews each day. You don't have to be afraid. It might be something that, that's within your mind. If you are, then after every fart salah, just pray Ayatul Kursi. I mean, there's, a, there's a beautiful hadith in Bukhari where uh, Abu Hurair radiallahu anhu is looking after the zakat treasury and a thief comes to steal it. And it's in hadith of Sahih Bukhari and he, he catches him and he says, I'm going to take you, who are you? I'm going to take you straight to the Prophet sallallahu So he begs, he says, look, I, I, I'm hungry and I've got a family to feed and you know, I'm, I'm, I've only come for this. Please let me go, let me go, let me go. Right? So Abu Hurairah then lets him go and then he comes to the Prophet ﷺ and he relates to him and he says that Messenger of Allah, you know, there's someone who I caught and Prophet ﷺ he smiled and he said he said he's lied to you innahu kathub he's lied to you, he's gonna come back to you he's gonna come back and Abu Huraira goes back to the zakat treasury and he waits and this person comes back the next night and tries to steal. And he grabs hold of him and he says, I'm going to take you to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he begs him and he says, please, I'm hungry, my family you know, are starving, please let go of me, let go of me. So Abu Huraira lets him go. And he reports again to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Inna hu la kadhub, wa inna hu He said, he's lying, he's going to come back to you. And this happened three or four times over and then on the fourth time or something, this, this person that is catchy is the person says, please, I'll teach you something. I'll teach you something if you let go of me this time. He said, what? He said, if you want protection from uh, so the shayateen or the jinns, you should recite Ayatul Kursi. Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyul And he read the whole thing to Abu Hurairah. And Abu Hurairah came to the Prophet and he said, 
Messenger of Allah, this is what happened last night. And Prophet ﷺ said, he told you the truth on this occasion, though he's a liar. Because oh, Abu Huraira, it was no other person except for Shaitan. It was Shaitan that you had caught on all these nights. And it was Shaitan that actually said this. So if you're scared in any way, then one of the things is Ayatul Kursi to recite that and to believe in that. Uh, and that will be enough as a protection. There's a hadith that says that if you re recite Ayatul Kursi after the fourth prayer, it's in, it's in Nasai. لَمْ يَمْنَعْهُ مِنْ دُخُولِ الْجَنَّةِ إِلَّا الْمَوْتِ Nothing will prevent the person from getting into Jannah except the coming of death. Meaning that when death comes to him, he's going straight to Jannah. If you recite Ayatul Kursi after every fourth prayer, this is the case. And it's also a very good form of protection in many ahadiths, it's, it's been said. So again, with yourself, don't be, you know, you don't need to be um, scared at all, unless you've obviously got, got a reason to be scared. Uh, can Rukia be potentially life-threatening if you suspect black magic? Um, not really. Um, no, the answer is no. It says, uh, again, the question is repeated. If it's to the elderly and is life-threatening. Again, look, people who do the ruqya, if they're good, they would know what, they, what extent they can go to. Just like a doctor. A doctor is not going to pump any medicine inside you if he knows that too much medicine in your body is not going to be good for you. Same way, if there's a very, very weak individual, that the person who's doing the ruqya would know when, when to stop and how much to actually, how far to go. What can you do to prevent yourself from all of this thingy shaitans, bad jinns? Right. Um, yes, to protect yourself, one thing I've repeated again and again is um, Ayat al-Kursi. And another part that I will just relate to you. The dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is very, um, very effective. Adhan, if you recite Adhan or, or say the Adhan in your bedroom or wherever it is and say loudly towards the Qibla, it is a form of keeping, or in your house if you say the Adhan, it's a way of keeping the Shayateen away. Sp specifically reciting Surah Al-Baqarah, which has been mentioned in Tirmidhi, is another form again of protection. If you can't recite it, then even to play a CD in the house is also effective uh, to keep it continuous. Uh, if the CD is continuous, then it's, then it's effective. Um, another one is, um, there's a book called The Manzil. There's a book called The Manzil. It's just full of Quranic ayats, a number of ayats, which ulama have recited over a number of time, and they've, they've used this, uh, and, and, they've, and they've experienced that reciting this after every Fajr and after every Maghrib. It's only ayats of the Quran. And to blow in your hands, to pass over the body, it's, it's very effective in keeping yourself from the, uh, away from the influence of the, uh, of the jinns or the influence of sihr and so on. And you can do that. Now manzil you can um, you know, get from a good Islamic bookshop. You can just ask them for the manzil. Very small book, about 30, 40 p or something. Uh, and, and to be consistent in reading that, uh, is a good way. If you feel that the effects are still there and you need to do more, okay, you need to do more, again, the best thing is to increase your tilawa, to increase the amount, and do it loudly. Do tilawa loudly. It's more effective for jinns than to just read it quietly in your mind. And um, to do dhikr, in terms of doing dhikr, if you do dhikr and you start to something specific like hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil, where you're putting your trust in Allah, Allah is, suffices us when Yamal Wakil and is the best best that we can suffice and to repeat that constantly is again a, a, a good um, protection or to say some of the ad'iyah ma'thura some of the things that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam used to say or the Quran has told us Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min hamazati shayateen wa an yahdurun this specific dua the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam has told us to uh, stay, say specifically, O oh Allah, I seek your protection, uh, your protection from the evil influences of this shayateen and the fact that they come and be with me. Rabbi a'udhu bika min hamazati shayateen wa yahdurun is specifically in the Quran. You can recite this over and over again uh, for your uh, protection. Well, no. Similar to that, it's what if you read all of this and you still get affected. He says, if you, if you read all of these things and still feel the effects, what can you do? Again, look, something's weak within yourself. 
Um, either your ibadat is not being done properly, either you in ma'asid. Some people might be reading a lot and doing a lot, but they might be sinning. If you're sinning, then it's going to just remove the effects of all your reading, or some of the effects of your reading. Or maybe your purity is not there. Now, one thing is to be pure in terms of how you go to the toilet is very, very important. Your clothes being clean, your bed staying clean, your, your house staying clean of impurities, najas especially with urine, with excretion, with things that are absolutely, you know, forbidden to pray in. Those things you have to cleanse your house and, and your surroundings from. You will find the influences will be greater. When your amal and your actions are there and for a long time, you can't suddenly become practicing and you know, expect the best of results. You have to be onto it for some continuous time and you will see good effects of it. Sometimes again, it might be very influential, but what you have to do is again, you have to just carry on with your, you know, the best is your own amal. And if not, you know, you go to shuyukh, you go to certain shuyukh that deal with this and you go to, you know, um, certain people who, who, who are better than others. If you find one sheikh couldn't deal with it, you take leave and you go to another sheikh and you, you, you try and get, you know, uh, them to deal with the case. And bi'idhnillah, somewhere or another you will find the cure. Oh, can a human being control a jinn? Um, human beings can get influence. Uh, over jinn. Uh, normally what the Quran has said that normally happens is that the, the human beings start to become subdued to the jinns. This is most of the cases. So, so there's so the certain men who will start to take protection in jinns. This is specifically mentioned in Surah Al-Jinn. And that happens, you know what I said to you that the worshipping of shaitan is getting the influence of shaitan, so getting under their influence and then getting them, to, you know, using them for certain things, that normally happens. But can a person influence a jinn? Yes, they can. And they can come in contact with a jinn and they can basically, uh, you know, sometimes they can befriend you, sometimes they can just come and befriend you. Um, and that is rare, but it's possible that they come and befriend you. They come and they make themselves known to you. So you, if you hear in empty space one day, you hear Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. You know, don't run away. Just say wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Where's your hand quick? You know, shake my hand. Yeah? Yeah, if you've got the guts to do that. It happened to me once. I was in a, this was years back, um, in a big tent where I went to look for something in the dark. No one was in that tent and I, and I heard this and I tell you, my, my heart just stopped you know, for a few seconds because I was quite young then at that time and then just about managed to get out of that tent. But then I went back because I thought, you know what, I'm losing out on the chances. I went back but then there was nothing replying back to me. I was saying salam, salam in the corner and nothing replying back to me. But then my sheikh confirmed that it was a jinn that was, that was trying to communicate or contact. So at that, that moment if you do, then they, they can contact you. However, most cases they, they won't do that. Most cases they won't do that, but what you can do, sometimes they're in your house. There have been cases where there's been young children I know that have, that have talked to me specifically that they've seen, they've seen jinns you know, around in the household. And sometimes they can reveal, now they've got their choice if they want to reveal themselves to someone, they can reveal themselves. If they, if they want to be in this crowd here, they want to reveal themselves to one person and not to the rest of us, they can do that. They just go into their mind, make them see them and not, not anyone else. That can be the case. However, this question about you influencing them, there are ways, but it's not allowed for a human being to just go out there and just to catch a jinn and to influence them uh, and to bring them under their possession. Once Rasulullah he caught a jinn inside the masjid and he tied the jinn to a pillar of the masjid. And then he وسلم, he let the jinn go. And he said, hadn't it been for him remembering the dua of, of Sulaiman salam, he would have waited till the Sahaba came and saw what a jinn looks like. He said, because Sulaiman salam said, Rabbi habli mulkan la yanbaghi li ahadim min ba'di. No one after me, O oh Allah, should have a kingdom as great as mine. Give me such a kingdom. And that's when Allah gave him the power of the jinns as well as the human beings. So Rasulullah remembered that and he said, you know, I remember that, so I, I, I you know, it was my brother who was Suleiman who said that, so I didn't want to influence. Now that doesn't mean that, you know, it's, it's completely forbidden for anyone in any way to, you know, to trap a jinn in any way. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa for whatever reason, 
he did this. Of course, yes, we shouldn't go out there and start to, you know, look out for jinns and start catching them, whatever. You know, it's quite dangerous to do that anyway. It's, it's dangerous to, you know, there are ways, and I'm not going to get into that, but influencing and catching a shaitan is almost like turning a free person into a slave. So you can imagine if somebody came and wanted to grab hold of you, catch you, and take you and sell you off as a slave or use you as a slave, how much you will rebel against that. You can imagine now what will happen to a jinn if you're going there and trying to influence them and you know, use them as a slave. They're going to rebel and sometimes it can end up very painful to the one who's trying to control them or they can um, you know, kill you. There's been cases when they've killed human beings because they've tried to influence them. But there are some human beings that are able to get in contact with jinns and use them for exorcism. There are shuyukh that, that do that. Right? And, and again, if you don't believe in this, you just go, need to go and spend some time with these shuyukh and be around them and see how they actually do it. Uh, I met I met one of these in, in Trinidad. Um, I, I, you, you can, it, it's, it's weird, but unless you go and see the shuyukh, you know, sometimes they can even force a jinn and imprison it into a bottle or something like that. And, and you can be there around and see within the glass or the, or the bottle a creature that is weird looking inside. Now again, please, don't want to believe in, don't believe in it. But if you, the only way you're going to believe in some of these things is to actually be with the shoe, spend time with them and see what they do in their actual process when you see it, it's something different. Can Rukia be done on non-Muslim? See, non-Muslims have their own sort of Rukia. Now the Bible has got some truth in it, we don't deny that. And you know, when, when priests are things, uh, other, other sort of uh, religious leaders, they do ruqya from their own books. If there's truth in that from the real words of Allah, what He revealed, there's still some form of truth in that, it will have its effect. And that's why they have their own ruqya. It doesn't mean that their religion is sort of true. Now, whether a, a Muslim can do ruqya and a non Muslim, I don't know. I've never come across that, uh, I'll be honest with you. I have heard that when sheikhs do ruqya and take a jinn out of someone, some jinns hold grudges and try to get the shaykh back by attacking or possessing one of the family members, is this true? See, this is one of the things that is important if anyone's going into exorcism is that you have to know the larger effects of what they're capable of doing. And that's why any shaykh that does exorcism, they will have, you know, they will have regular readings for their own family members where they will, and their household. So they can protect their children and protect their wife and their you know, family from attacks. It can happen and sometimes it does happen where they come back and they want to attack. But if the shuyukh will know to recite and make sure that they're making their own protection for themselves and for their, for their families. Is the Holy Ghost a type of jinn? No. They believe it was Jibreel, alayhi salam, but I don't know how they come up with that. You know. Actually, the person who wrote it, he wrote, is the Holy Ghost. Uh, <laughs> a type of jinn. Do aliens exist? <laughs> now, we're, we're getting quite, quite good at this, isn't the, the unseen world, we're getting to the end. You know, I've, I've said time and again, as far as we believe, you know, we haven't seen aliens, right? We haven't met aliens, so we're not going to believe in aliens right now. But if you ever see aliens coming and dropping on this planet, we're going to say Assalamu Alaikum. <laughs> now if they know what Assalamu Alaikum is, we're going to say, how do you know that? Have you uh, got the Quran? This is the Quran. We give da'wah. <laughs> yeah? We give da'wah. Why not? If they're a creature, if they can't understand us, we'll use sign language. Yeah? That's if they exist. The whole hype is whether they exist or they don't exist. <coughs> now, we don't need to be bothered by something that may exist. Our deen hasn't said anything about you know, other creatures on other planets. As far as we're concerned, we're the only two that are being addressed by the Qur'an. It's the, the, the human beings and the jinns. There's, there's nothing else. Now, if it happens that one day you know, we find out that there are, then you know, we'll deal with it at that time. You know, not now, to hypothetically tell you what to do when you meet an alien. Yeah? <laughs> right, my wife had a 
Saya, I have been told, what is your his advice? Uh, okay. Uh, right. Uh, I think some people believe that, you know, th there can be, um, I don't know, there, there can be a dark sh shadow that overpowers them or something. Um, again, look, you've got to look at the symptoms of what, they, what they've been through and then take them to specialists to deal with it. You can't just come to a conclusion. Um, I remember one, one good thing that one of our sheikhs said to us, you know, we used to go to them and say, you know, sometimes you're asleep, you're lying down in sleep, and in your sleep you can't move. You're trying to move, and you can't breathe as well. Has anyone had that happen to them? Put your hands up. Whoa, we've got about 20 people, oh, jin, 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 jin. I'm joking, joking, yeah? So, you know, I've had that, and I've had uh, other people in the mother's house, we've gone to the sheikh and we've said, you know, sheikh, this has happened, you know, and you, you just last moment, when you're about to feel like you're about to die or something, and you say the word Allah or something, whatever you say, and then you get sort of released. <clears throat> um, so the sheikh confirmed, he said, look, this mainly, he said, is because there's probably some phlegm or something that's within your sort of nose that, that goes all the way down to a part of your so you know, in between where your breathing passage is. So, and it happens mostly, he said, while you're lying on your back. While you're lying on your back. So he's advised us to clear up the throat, to clean the nose probably before we go to sleep. And if it happens, he said, just turn your side. He said, mostly it happens because that part of the phlegm whatever goes down to a place where it doesn't allow you to breathe. Now I found it kind of never happened to me again after that. But people will say across the world that that's a jinn. There's a specific type of jinn that comes and gets you. So sometimes it might not be a jinn. And sometimes it might be. So you will only find out if you just go to the right person, to a good sheikh, and you, you ask them about it. Any more? Oh. Washing the nose, of, nose for wudu, since shaitan sits in your nose at night, does that mean you only wash in the morning wudu or every wudu? Every wudu, please. Because it's a sunnah of the Prophet The morning one is just there to, you know, that one will remove the influence. But generally throughout the day he might come and he might just sort of rest because he likes impure places. Why would God create a jinn for what use? And he says non-Muslim here. Why did God create a jinn? Well, He created jinn and He created men so that we, we serve Him. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Allah says, I never created jinn, I never created men except that they serve me and they worship me. The whole point, point was that we serve Him and not disobey Him. I heard a hadith that 70,000 people will enter Jannah without any reckoning and one of the reasons for this is because they didn't get Ruqya done on them. Does this mean that if a person is affected by sihar, it's better to go not, to not go to someone to do ruqya on them? No, 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 no. See, first thing is that hadith I've never heard of. That if you if you never got ruqya done on them, then you one of the seventy thousand. I've never heard of that. Please, you'd have to forward me that hadith for me to see the verification of it, and the rest of it. No, it doesn't make any sense. Is there a particular way? we should dispose of our hair, fingernails, dippings, whatever. Well, the sunnah is that you actually put it into the soil. That is the sunnah. That your fingernails and your hair go back into the soil. Because part of the human being, whatever part of it, it is, goes back in there. But the, the kind of societies we live in, you know, you can't, you can't do that. You know, don't you guys to start burying, you know, your neighbors looking. <laughs> Man, they already call us terrorists, right? They're going to call us, you know, witch terrorists or I don't know, or wizard terrorists or whatever they're going to call us next. So it, it's societies that we might, now if you, somebody still wants to do it, fine, you do it. But it's a bit difficult, you know, the kind of small little garden, wherever you've got, you know, you don't want to fill it up with fingernails, right? And hair. So you can dispose of it in your dustbins, it's fine. How can you tell between a person that actually has a jinn in them and a person that is just crazy or has a bad behavior? That's true. Sometimes people have bad behavior and they act as if they've got a jinn with them. I came to a recent case here. Guy was messing around with his wife, as in he, he was seeing another woman. And when he got caught, when he got caught, yeah, he said, 
Sheikh, I haven't been feeling well lately, you know. <laughs> he started off, on his style of that, they said, I haven't been feeling well. Now his wife and his hu the husband and wife both know me. Eh? So now I'm talking to the husband over the phone and he said to me, look, you know, I went to a recent course and they're talking about some influences and I'm seeing some of the symptoms inside me and I've sort of forgotten a few things. And, said, and I said to him, I said, get serious, man. I said, you telling me that all these things that you've been doing was the effect of a, of a, of a shaitan or a jinn. I said, you're having a laugh. I said, listen, man, you had lust and desire inside you. Come on, man. Yeah, you fancied that woman. Talk about it. Yeah? He goes, well, actually. I said, don't do that, actually. It's true. Now you're blaming on a jinn or something. So I just, just kind of, you know, invisibly slapped him a bit. I told him, you know, get alive, what are you doing? <coughs> Blaming all your things on a gym. Some people do that. So, um, I remember once there was a, um, there was a kid in our village. He was actually one of our cousins who, who just went a bit mad once, yeah? And my dad came. Uh, and my dad used to do some of this ruqya. Not, not heavy sort of ruqya, he used to do sort of light ruqya. So my dad came and started reading. Started reading, my dad's reading, my dad's reading. And suddenly, my dad just grabbed my cousin and he just slapped him on. I said, will you do that again? And he goes, no, uncle. I go, you do that again, then you, you finish. And my dad walked off. Went, what was that? And my dad said, well, I've been reading here, sitting here reading, and there's no effect. He not, he's got no gin inside him. He's just been crazy. He's just doing you know, silly things inside the village, and he's blaming it. He's trying to make it look like he's got a gin. Because my dad knows that when he recites, when he recites, there's, and there's a gin there, it will be affected. It will you know, show some kind of symptoms. Um, so again, look, you, you have to sort of, um, you have to go to specialists for this. You can't, be a, you can't do a, a DIY job in your house. And don't try as well. Yeah? <laughs> I have worked in a lot of mental health wards in my experience. A lot of the patients talk about heaven and hell and devils quite obsessively. They also have to be restrained a lot because of behavior. Do they have genes? Again, look, I can't say. Every case differs. Every single case differs. There could be some cases in some mental hospitals. As I said to you, some of them are really mental. Some of them might be jinns. And the only way you will know is for a proper sheikh to come and to assess them, you know, one by one. That would mean that he will have to sit with them and start reciting the Quran. Um, I've seen it done several occasions. Several occasions the sheikh comes in. Sometimes the sheikh just walks in and then the person basically just gone mad. And they just want to say something, you know, who are, you know, get out of my way, I don't, want to, I don't want you to be here. Sometimes the sheikh starts to just recite. As the moment he's recited, it starts. Sometimes the sheikh recites for a little while. Sometimes it could take, you know, up to uh, a few minutes, sometimes more than that. And then you see some effects. And sometimes they don't see any effects. And they conclude that it's just a mental, it's, it's a mental health issue. Sometimes, that, you know, that's been the case. You said the jinn is the same as human, so does that mean they die as well. Yes, they do die. They do have longer lives than us. <clears throat> they do live for sometimes up to several hundred years they can live. Sometimes uh, a lot longer than us they can live. They do also have a lot more power than us. Physical power, physical strength. But we have intelligence, the, the, the supremacy of our intelligence is much more higher than theirs. That's where Iblis also was very, very angry. Because Adam salam knew the names of all of these things. Whatever Allah showed him, he knew the concepts. And jinns, Iblis is a jinn, he didn't know any of that. And that's what, that's what, caught, that's what got the arrogance inside uh, Iblis. Because he was, this man knows so much about the world and he's just been born. Allah's just, given, you know, just, just come to life. And he obviously, you know, he's got a lot more knowledge than myself. So that's one thing that we have over them, and they're, they're really scared of that. The fact that you know, we, we human beings can think in ways that they can't think. Um, so, so they're very much scared of that. But we've got, like I said, we've got um, other, they've got other strengths over, this, uh, over us, we've got some strengths over them. If I know that someone is affected by a jinn in another country, can I do dua for this uh, country and help that person? Will I get attacked for helping that person? No, no. If you make dua for somebody, if you make dua for somebody uh, because they've been affected, nothing's going to happen to you. If you make, 
if, if, even if you give advice to someone, you know, general advice, nothing's going to happen to you. I give advice to a lot of people, send them to, you know, go to the sheikh, go to the sheikh, whatever, try and do this, read Surah Baqarah at home. All the advice I'm giving to you today, if it was going to be the case that you're going to be affected, then I better watch out when I go home, right? So nothing's going to happen, nothing's going to happen. But what you shouldn't do is start your, you know, I mean, if you're, if you're, just a husband and your wife's been affected and because I know a brother just in North London you know he's not a, he's not a great learning person he's not an exorcist whatever but he's just a normal person he, he prays he's practicing his wife is practicing as well and they've been affected by something whatever it is you know and Maghrib time his wife just changes she just flips and she's a different person uh, and there's actually another case as well right now that this is happening in again in North London so I've, I've, I've advised both of them, they're not, they're not ulama, they're not people who learn, they're not people who have gone through a madrasa or a system or who have the Qur'an or anything like that. But I've just told them generally that look, you know, because they're strong individuals, I know, you know who they are, they're strong individuals. So I've said when your, wives, when your wife sort of uh, goes into the state then you should start reciting, you know, hold her down. Uh, recite something, recite Fatiha, recite Atul Kursi, recite Mu'awad Thayqul Adh Falaqul Adh Nas, you know and blow on the individual um, and recite it several times if you have to and you know whatever a surah baqarah if you please start with surah baqarah give the adhan right loudly and they do this and one of them has said specifically that um, the influence has become a lot lot less than when it first started you know a lot lot less so um, yes if you're a person at home and you want to just do this much but you're a strong individual you know you've got strong power then you can do it you can do it and at least you've got something going on because you can't always call someone down to your house. But if you're not or you don't know what you're doing, please just don't, don't start anything. Go to an expert. Where is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how could the jinn listen to his orders? Now, look, they're not listening to Allah. I didn't say that in the, in the talk. No, I said that they, they will listen to some conversations of the angels on the, you know, on the, on the part where a heaven ends and the next sort of earth um, starts. So here again, um, it is not to, it's not about them listening to Allah, but and they're not listening to Allah's direct orders, but they listen to some conversations of the of the angels. And this is something that used to happen. Look in the tafsir of Surah Al-Jinn, and you will find find this so Surah Al-Safat. Look in the beginning of it and look at the tafsir, and you will find some of this there. So again, um, you know, the the last thing that that I would say is that you know, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of other stories and things or whatever I can fill you in with, but you know, I guess we'll keep that for another time when we're, you know, sitting somewhere nice and quiet in the dark, yeah? And um, we've answered, gone through the questions.